good day, grade 11. Sorry about this. Um, we are standing a bit late and I apologize. My laptop decided to quit on me just a couple of seconds before um, we were supposed to go on broadcast. So I had to restart it. So just hang in there. The PowerPoint will start very, very soon, I promise. And then um, we will get going. And let me just get rid of all of this. There we go. Um, hmm. uh, exit. There we go. I was testing out a calendar for someone. Okay. Let's do the slideshow from beginning. There we go. <clears throat> so I'm really sorry about that. Um, we will skip the countdown, shall we? Since we are already with the lesson. Okay, so we're moving on with revision. Um, and basically what we're going to do is we're gonna carry on doing grade 11 mathematics revision, starting off at the moment with paper one, and then we're gonna loop, okay? So we'll do paper one, and when we finish going through paper one questions, and we'll go through paper two, etc., etc. You guys are welcome to contact me if you'd like to ask about specific questions, and then we can go through those specific questions. Right, so let's see. It says solve for x, 2x minus 1, x plus 5 equals 0. Okay, so the thing with this is that most people think that they have to multiply this thing out to solve it, okay, which is quite sneaky um, because what has actually happened is they've already broken it up for you. They've already factorized it. So what would normally happen is a lot of students will multiply this out, get it into a trinomial, refactorize it, and then get back into these brackets and then feel totally lost because they're back here and they don't know what to do. When in fact, what they've done is they've already taken the trinomial, factorized it for you, and now you're left with 2x minus 1, x plus 5. So now all you need to realize is either this bit here, the 2x minus 1 equals 0, or the x plus 5 equals 0. So for question 1.1.1, it is just 2x minus 1 equals 0, or x plus 5 equals 0. Therefore, 2x equals 1, or x is equal to negative 5. Therefore, x is equal to a half, or x is equal to negative 5. There we go. Now, let's move on to 1.1.2. And yes, just leave your answer in the simplest third form. So what does that tell us? It tells us we're definitely going to have to use the formula. And the formula is on your formula sheet. So x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And the only complicated thing about this is realizing that, for example, the whole of this is b. So minus 4 is b. Obviously, this is A, and plus 1 is C. And then we just have to substitute incorrectly. So let's do this, okay? So we're going to go X is equal to, so it's minus B, so it's going to be minus, minus 4, plus the square root of B squared is negative 4 squared minus 4 times by A, which is 2, times by c, which is 1, all over 2 times by a, which is 2, which is going to be minus times minus the plus, it's 4, plus or minus the square root of minus 4 squared is 16, minus 4 times 2 is 8, 8 times 1 is 8, all over 4. So do you agree that that becomes 4 plus or minus the square root of 8 over 4. And do you agree that that could be written as basically 4 plus or minus now 8, the square root of 8, can be written as the square root of 4 multiplied by 2, which can be written as 2 root 2, because you take the 4 out, and when we take it out, we square root it, so it becomes 2 root 2. So we've got 4 plus or minus 2 root 2 all over 4, um, which is then equal to, if you divide this, okay, if we divide the 4 into the first term and into the second term, it becomes 1 plus or minus root 2 over 2, because the 2 over 4 
becomes one over two. And there you go. Those are, it leaves your answer in the simplest third form. Ta-da! Okay, not too bad. Hey, you must just remember to use your formula. Now to simplify without the use of a calculator, the following expressions fully. Now guys, I'm serious about this. They will know when you're using a calculator, they will know. So you need to think about not doing that, okay? So if you look at this, you see it's 125 to the power of two over three. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use our prime factorization to see what we can get with this, okay? So if we do that, we've got 125. Now remember how prime factorization works. We're supposed to use from the smallest prime factor down, um, or up, should I say. Um, obviously, two doesn't work because it's an, an odd number. Um, let's have a look at it. Three doesn't work because three does not. Three goes into 12, but it doesn't go into five. So let's try five. Five goes into 125. Five goes into 12 twice, remainder two. Five goes into 25, five times. Now let's do another five. Five goes into 25, five times. Do a five, five goes into five once. So we can rewrite 125 as five cubed. So this becomes 125 to two over three is equal to five cubed to the power of two over three. Now the rule is what? Whenever you've got exponents across a bracket, you multiply these. So this is the same as five to three over one times by two over three. These cancel and you're left with five squared, which is 25. There you go. No calculator required. In fact, you didn't even have to do this if you know that 125 is five cubed or something like that. But this is showing you how you can do that without the use of a calculator. Right, now let's do question 1.2.2. They've got 3 root 2 minus 12, and then you've got 2 root 2 plus 1. So what we should do is we should use FOIL. Okay, we're going to use FOIL. We're going to do firsts, outers, inners, lasts, and then see if we can somehow make it look prettier. Okay, so First is going to be this, it's 3 root 2 multiplied by 2 root 2. Then it's outer, so it's plus 3 root 2. Then it's inner, so it's minus bracket 12 times 2 root 2. And then it's last, so it's minus 12. Okay, 3 times 2 is 6, do you agree? And root 2 times root 2 is just 2, so that's times 2. Plus 3 root 2, there's nothing we can do about that. This becomes minus 12 times 2 is 24, so it's 24 root 2. And then it's minus 12. Okay, so 6 times 2 is 12, and that's minus 12, so these cancel. And then you're just left with 3 root 2 minus 24 root 2, which becomes minus 21 root 2. And that's the final answer. Not too bad. Hey, not too bad at all. You just need to take it baby steps every time. Right, now it says, you're given x squared minus x minus 6 over 3x minus 5, 3x minus 9, and it says which value or values of x will this expression be undefined? This expression will be undefined when we are dividing by 0. So that means that it's going to be undefined when 3x minus 9 equals 0. So therefore 3x would equal 9 and x would equal 3. So the value when x equals 3 makes this undefined. So it would be when x equals 3. There you go. Now to simplify the expression fully. Okay, so we need to factorize and simplify. So we've got x squared minus x minus 6 over 3x minus 9. So let's see if we can factorize the top. We've got 1 and 1 are the factors of x squared, and 6 and 1 is going to be 3 and 2 minus 3 plus 2. So it becomes x minus 3, x plus 2, all over. Let's take out a common factor 3 here, and you're left with x minus 3, 
these cancel and you're left with x plus 2 over 3. How beautiful is that? Not too bad here. Next, it says, given that x plus 2, x minus 3 is smaller than 3x minus 3x plus 2, it says solve for x if this is the case. Okay, so what we need to do is multiply this out, get it as one whole term, and then factorize. Okay, so we're going to have it's x plus 2, x minus 3 is smaller than minus 3x plus 2. Right, so let's multiply this out. x times x is x squared. x times minus 3 is minus 3x. That becomes plus 2x minus 6. And we take this across, becomes plus 3x minus 2 is smaller than 0. So minus 3x cancels with 3x, which is quite nice. And what are you left with? We're left with x squared, okay, plus 2x minus 8 is smaller than 0. Okay, so now what they want to know, they want to know when is this true? For what values of x is this true? So guys, just for the record, if you looked at this question just a little bit further, it says, hence otherwise to sum this, determine the sum of all the integers, satisfying the expression of this, okay? So do you see that they kind of hinted that this thing here had to end up looking something similar to this because otherwise they wouldn't have gone hence. So by seeing that and then seeing this, I'm thinking, hmm, I did this right, now let's do the rest of it right, okay? So we're solving for x, so obviously we need a number line. And the factors of this are going to be um, 1 and 1, and your factors of 8 are 4 and 2, and that's at plus 4 minus 2. So it would be x plus 4, x minus 2 is smaller than 0. So my values would be negative 4 and 2. Right, now, when x is smaller than negative 4, in other words, it's minus 5, you'd have minus 5 times minus, which would be a positive, and minus times minus is a positive. Between negative 4 and 2, let's choose 0. 0 plus 4 is positive. 0 minus 2 is negative, so that's 0. Anything above 2, um, 3. 3 plus 4 is positive, 3 minus 2 is positive, so that's positive again. Or you could realize that this is a happy graph, it's a happy para parabola, and therefore we can just draw a graph like this. Okay, so there you go. So what are the values? The values for which this will work will be x is going to be smaller than 2 and greater than negative 4. Now it says, hence or otherwise determine the sum, the sum. They want the sum of all the integers satisfying this expression. So they want the sum of all the numbers between this. So do you agree? What are the numbers? It's obviously not 4. And they want the integers, which means they want the whole numbers. So it's going to be minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1. That is all the numbers, the integers, between minus 4 and 2. So these cancel and you're left with minus 5. So the sum of all the integers satisfying this expression is negative 5. There you go. Right, okay, it says given 4 to the x minus 1 plus 4 to the x plus 1 over 17 times 12 to the x. Simplify the expression fully. Okay, forget about what this is. Let's simplify the expression fully. So we've got 4. I'm going to break these up to make it a little bit easier. I'm going to go 4 to the x times 4 to the negative 1 plus 4 to the x times 4 to the 1 all over 17 times 12 to the x. Okay. So do you agree I could take out a common factor of 4 to the x? Okay, there's 4 to the x and there's a 4 to the x. So we're left with 4 to the x. And what are you left with? We're left with 4 to the negative 1 plus 4 over 17 multiplied. 12 can be broken up into 4 multiplied by 3 to the power of x. Okay, so do you agree that becomes 4 to the x? This is a quarter, so it's four and a quarter. We'll worry about how to write that just now. 
over 17, and then do you agree the 4 to the 3 of x cancels? We've got 4 to the x multiplied by... Can you do this? 4 times 3, yes you can. 3 to the x. So this cancels with this, okay? So now what do we have? We have 16 over 17, sorry, what? 17 over 4. 4 and a quarter is 17 over 4. Divided by 17 multiplied by 3 to the x, which is going to be the same as 17 over 4 times by 1 over 17 um, times by 1 over 3 to the x. So this cancels with this, and we're left with 1 over 4 multiplied by 3 to the x, which is the same as saying 3 to the negative x, wait, same as saying 4 times by 3 to the negative x. Do you agree? No, sorry, I'm wrong. It's the same as saying a quarter, a quarter multiplied by 3 to the negative x. Okay, that is a nice question. Then it says 2.2.2. If 3 to the negative x is equal to 4t, okay, then express this in terms of t. So do you agree that we already know that this is equal to a quarter 3 to the negative x? So we're saying, well, that expression is 3 quarter times by 3 to the negative x, so 3 to the negative x equals 4t, so therefore it's going to be 1 over 4 multiplied by 4 to the power of t, no, 4 to the power of t, 4t, just 4t, 4t, this cancels this and the answer is t, there you go. Hmm, nice question, I like that question a lot. Now it says solve for x and y, for, from the given equations. Sure. Okay, so let's have a look at this. We've got 3 to the y is equal to 81 to the x. That's 1. Here we've got y is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 9. Okay. So let's see if we can solve this either for y or for x, okay? Do you remember this, that, um, do you agree that this could be rewritten? We could write, if we had to prime factorize 81, we divide by 3, 3 goes into 81, 3 goes into 8 twice, remainder 2, try again, 2, 3 goes into 21, 7 times, 3 goes into 27, 9 times, 3 goes into 9, 3 times, and 3 goes into 3 once. So what do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4. So therefore we can say 3 to the y is equal to 3 to the 4 to the x. So for 3 to the y is equal to 3 to the 4x. This cancels with this. Therefore we can say y is equal to 4x. Excellent. So we're going to call the equation 1. Yeah, we have another equation, y is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 9, we're going to call that equation 2, and we're going to let equation 1 equal equation 2. So we're going to say, fine, 4x is equal to x squared minus 6x plus 9. So let's take everything on the one side and then equate the 2, we've got 0 is equal to x squared minus 6x minus 4x plus 9, which is going to be x squared minus 10x plus 9. If we factorize that, we get x minus 9, x minus 1 equals 0. Therefore, x is equal to 9 or x is equal to 1. Now we need to solve for y. Therefore, y is going to be 4 times by 9, which is 36, or y is equal to 4 times 1, which is 4. Therefore, the points are 9, 36, or 1, 4. And grade 11s, please understand, you cannot, cannot, cannot 
um, just write down uh, um, if x is 9 and x equals 1 and then y is equal to 1 and x is equals, you really, really, really do have to actually um, pair the coordinates up, okay? We are solving values for x and y to when they are equal to each other. Okay, do you understand that? Right, let's have a look at the next question. It says the solution to the quadratic equation is x equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 8p over 4, where p is an element of q. And what is q? q are rational, rational numbers, which means that they can be written as fractions. It says determine the value of p such that the roots of the equation are equal. Okay. Do you remember a thing called delta? Delta is the same as what's under the square root of a parabola. Okay, and for the roots to be equal, delta has to equal zero. For the roots to be equal, for 3.1.1. Why? Because then you would only have three plus or minus four, or, or it would be three over four. That's what it is. But now that you want to know is what are the values of P so that that is true. So we need to say, okay, fine, for four minus eight P has to equal zero, four equal roots, right? Therefore, minus eight P is equal to four. Therefore, P is equal to minus a half. P is equal to minus a half. Then it says the roots of the equation are non-real. So non-real roots only occur if the delta is smaller than naught. Why? Because then we have the square root of a negative number. And the square root of a negative number means that the roots are non-real. So for 3.1.2, we need delta to be smaller than zero. So we've got 4 minus 8p is smaller than zero. So then you got minus 8p is smaller than negative 4, becomes a negative when you take the other side. Now we're going to divide both sides by a negative, this 8. So what happens is we therefore change the signs. So p is going to be greater than minus 4 over 8. Therefore p is greater than, actually it's a plus because minus times a minus is a plus, is greater than a half. Oh, I made a mistake. Whoops, sorry. That's supposed to be positive a half because when you take that across, it becomes minus, and then when you divide by minus, it stays a negative, and a minus to minus is a plus. My apologies for that. Right, now it says, given the square root of 5 minus x is equal to x plus 1, Without solving the equation, show that the solution of the above equation lies in the interval between x is smaller than or equal to 5 and greater than or equal to negative 1. Okay, do you agree that this number here is 2? So we need this number here to... Okay, wait, hang on a minute. Sorry, 2. Where did I get that from? I'm just making stuff up. Okay, let me write, rewrite this so you can see what we're doing. We've got the square root of 5 minus x is equal to x plus 1. Okay, they say without solving, it showed the solution of the above equation lies in the interval for x is bigger than or equal to minus 1 and greater than or equal to 5. Okay. If we can't, this can't be a negative. Okay, so if this can't be a negative, then this can't be a negative either. So for that to be positive, x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Okay, do you understand that? Because the square root of this number can never be negative, right? So therefore, this can't be negative. Similarly, the work stuff under here cannot be negative. Therefore, 5 minus x has to be greater than or equal to naught. Therefore, x has to be smaller than or equal to 5. There you go. Problem solved. Now it says solve the equation. Okay, so we've got the square root of 5 minus x equals x plus 1. Now to solve this, what you need to do is you need to square both sides. So we end up with 5 minus x is equal to x plus 1 squared. So what we've done is we've squared both sides in order to get rid of the square root sign. So we end up with 5 minus x is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 1. 
Now we need to solve. So we're going to go up here and we're going to go x squared plus 2x plus x is plus 3x plus 1 minus 5 is minus 4 equals 0. The factors are going to be x and x and 4 and 1 and plus and minus equals 0. Therefore, x is equal to negative 4. Does it work? x has to be greater than equal to negative 1 or smaller than equal to no, it does not. Or x is going to be equal to 1. Does 1 work? Yay, it does. Choo -choo. Right. Done. Done. Now it says without further calculation, solve the equation. Okay, without further calculation, solve the equation. Well, do you agree that if we put a minus in front of this, okay, what are we doing? If we put a minus in front of that, we're just going to square that and we're going to square that. So it's going to have the same solution. It's going to have exactly the same solution. Same solution because we are squaring both sides to solve for it. Huh, okay, next. Right, so now we're on to analytical geometry or coordinate geometry, whichever you prefer. It says A is 0.16, B is 3.0, C is 12.3, and D, a trapezium, which means that these two sides are parallel, but they're not equal, and there's no relationship between these, no relation between these two sides. AD is parallel to BC, E is the midpoint of BC. Oh, E is the midpoint of BC. Okay. The angle of nation on the straight line BC is theta. It says calculate the coordinates of E. Okay, so that's easy. The midpoint theorem. Midpoint is basically saying we need to add the x values. So it's 12 plus 3 divided by 2. Then we need to add the y values, which is 0 plus 3, and we divide it by 2 to get the midpoint. 15 over 2 is 7 and a half, and 3 over 2 is 1 and a half. So this point here, E, is going to be 7 and a half, 1 and a half. Okay. Now it says determine the gradient of the line BC. Right. So the gradient of BC is going to be equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we're going to choose a point to be 2 and a point to be 1. I'm going to just randomly choose this as 2 and this is 1. So therefore we're going to say 3 minus 0 over 12 minus 3 which is 3 over 9, which is a third. Ta -da! So therefore, the gradient of the line BC, Y, is equal to a third X plus C. We don't know what that is. It says calculate the magnitude of theta. Now, we all know that tan theta is equal to the gradient. Okay. Um, right. So theta tan theta is going to be opposite over adjacent but we don't need we do know that but the gradient we've already worked out is a third so we can go theta is equal to we can go second function tan oh yes i forgot i didn't get my calculator out because the computer died oh right, anyway I don't know why I can't be reached. It's weird. I'm online. Um, right, so what are we doing? Shift tan of 1 over 3. Close bracket equals 18.43 degrees. So theta is 18,43 degrees. Let's write that down, 18,43 degrees. Right, now it says prove that AD pass is perpendicular to AB. 
OK, so how do we do that? We can say, well, we know that things are perpendicular if their gradient when multiplied together equal minus one. So we need to obviously find the gradient of AD as well as the gradient of AB. And if they are perpendicular, then we have matched them. Right, so let's have a look at it, OK? M of AB is going to equal 6 minus 0 over 1 minus 3, which is going to be 6 over negative 2, which is negative 3. OK, now we need the gradient of AD. But the cool thing of AD is that it's equal to the gradient of BC. BC, which we know, which is 1 third. Therefore, we can say minus 3 multiplied by 1 third is equal to negative 1. Therefore, we can say, yay, AD is perpendicular to AB. Okay, so now we know that they are perpendicular. Right, now it says a straight line passing through the vertex A does not pass through any of the sides of the trapezium. This line makes an angle of 45 degrees with the side AD of the trapezium. So it's this line here that we're looking at. Determine the equation of this line. So it makes an angle of 45 degrees with the line angle to this, okay? So do you agree that we worked out that this angle here was 18,43 degrees, right? And if this is 18.43 degrees and this is 45 degrees to that, then the gradient or the theta of this new line is going to be 18,43 plus the 45, which is 348,43 degrees, okay? So what we need to find is a gradient. So we know that tan of theta is equal to m. Therefore, m is going to be second function tan of theta. So let's do that. So it's going to be shift tan of 68.43 close bracket equals 89.16 degrees. So theta is 89.16 degrees. Okay, now let us continue. 89.16 degrees. And so now we haven't finished. Now that we've got the angle of the gradient, we can find the actual angle because we know that Sorry. So we know that theta equals, I'm going to just see something. What have I done? Oh, no wonder. Shame. I'm sorry. I wasn't quite with it. Um, let me just, sorry. Let me just fix this. I don't know what I was thinking. So now we're just going to find m, right? Because we know that tan theta equals m and we have m. It's 68.43 degrees. So you're going to go m is tan of 68,43 degrees. So we're going to go shift. No, we're not going to go shift. Clear. We're going to go tan of 68.43 close bracket equals 2.53. So the gradient of this line, M, is 2,53. And now we want the equation of that line, but it's going through the 0.16. So that becomes quite easy because then we can say, well, 2.53, hey, here is link. Y is equal to MX plus C. M, what did we say, was 2.53. So M equals 2.53. We can find the C by substituting in the X and Y values of this point. So we go 6 is equal to 1 times 2,53 plus C. So C is going to be 6 minus 2,53. So let's get that out on a calculator. So we got 6 minus 2.53. 
3 equals 3.47. So therefore C is going to be 3 comma 4, 7. Therefore the equation is Y is equal to 2 comma 5, 3, X plus 3 comma 4, 7. Hmm. Very nice question that. Very, very nice question indeed. Right. Another coordinate geometry or analytical geometry question. It says in the diagram below, P is minus 317. Q and O and S are vertices of a parallelogram. That means that this line is parallel to this, and this line is parallel to this, and this line is equal to this, and this line is equal to this. The sides OS and OQ are defined by the equations. This is Y is equal to 6X, and this is Y equals negative X. Okay, and QOS is equal to alpha. Now it says determine the equation of QP, QP, in the form Y equals MX plus C. Well, we know what the gradient is at 6, okay? So we can go, well, Y is equal to 6X plus C. How do we know that? Because this is a parallelogram and opposite sides are parallel. So that we do have a point, it's minus 317. So we can substitute in, so we've got 17, is equal to 6 times minus 3 plus C. So therefore we've got 17 plus 18 is equal to C. So C is equal to 35. Therefore this equation here is going to be Y is equal to 6X plus 35. Done. It says hence determine the coordinates of Q. Hence determine the coordinates of Q. Okay, so Q is going to occur where these two lines are equal. So in other words, we're going to go Y is equal to 6X plus 35 and Y is equal to negative X, right? So we can let the two be equal and we can solve for the, that value there. So we go 6X plus 35 is equal to negative X, right? So we take that across and we go 35 is equal to negative 7x. So x is going to be negative 5, right? So x is negative 5. y is equal to the opposite of x. So y is going to be 5. So for the q points on negative 5, 5. Calculate the length of OQ. Leave your answer in simplified versions. Okay, so now this point is x is negative 5, y is 5. So the length of this line we will carry on with on Wednesday when we do the next math lesson. Have a great day.